Good morning, class. I said, good morning, class. This is Mr. Lamond, and we're learning from home. So we're going to finish up with Unit 12, World War II, and we're going to take a look at what was different about America in 1946. You might recognize this question. We asked a very similar question at the end of the Great War. What was different about America in 1919? You might remember. Some of the things we talked about then were changes in society for women and the lost generation and the way we looked at war. We talked about our economic advancements after World War I. Some strong nativism led to the Emergency Quota Act, Shank versus the United States, and civil liberties. So we're going to have the same conversation, but after a much bigger and more profound war. What was different about America in 1946? Soldiers are home, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You'll have an opportunity to take a second and pause to put this vocabulary on the page. But for now, I'm gonna skip through and go to changes in government. Now, FDR, as you can see here, was reelected to a third term in 1940 and to a fourth term in 1944. First president not to serve three terms, but to be elected to four. Blue right past the two-term idea. What's the P word for that? Precedence, established by George Washington way, way back. Think about the other two presidents who maybe dealt with this precedence the most. One dealt with the bus and the Native Americans, sadly. One dealt with a canal and a big stick. You might remember Andrew Jackson and Teddy Roosevelt were our two presidents who probably had the most problems with a desire to bust through the anti-third term principle. Well, why was FDR elected to four terms? Well, think about what got elected, him elected the first two, the Great Depression. He followed as a Democrat after a series of three Republican, pro-business, laissez-faire, Harding Coolidge Hoover presidents. America was definitely ready for change. They would have been ready for change regardless. But in this case, they're looking for a way FDR had an issue to deal with. It was the Great Depression and his New Deal, his three R's, and most probably, most importantly, his leadership. We have nothing to fear but fear itself, said on a fireside chat or in his inaugural address. FDR was the leader we needed. Well, when World War II started, America kind of realized you don't switch horses in midstream. And if he could defeat the Great Depression, maybe he could defeat Hitler and Tojo too. And so he was elected somewhat overwhelmingly to those extra two terms. Well, after the war, after and soon after, we passed the 22nd Amendment. Two plus two is four terms, and you're not allowed to serve four terms anymore. So it put to law what Washington had put as precedence. Another change in government was the way we suspended civil liberties again. If you think about it, we had done the same thing during World War I with the Espionage and Sedition Act. There was some anti-German sentiment, but nothing we had done then compared to what we did World War II. With the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, many Americans had this view, center political cartoon, of Japanese Americans. So I recognize the cartoonist, very similar style. That's Dr. Seuss. You might see his name written right down here in the bottom. Dr. Seuss basically produced this cartoon saying that all Japanese Americans were picking up their dynamite as the honorable fifth column. Fifth column is a nickname for saboteurs and spies doing things behind enemy lines. And America was scared that the Japanese were going to attack the mainland. Remember, we have no fleet to protect us. And so you start having racist things like this. Japs keep moving. This is a white man's neighborhood, which just makes no sense for a white man's neighborhood. But there was lots and lots of Americans who wanted Japanese to pack a suitcase, get on a bus, take their kids and tag them, put them on a train, and send them to internment camps, which is a nice way of saying concentration camps, because only the Germans use concentration camps. 
These internment camps were in states like Colorado and Wyoming. Uh, they were sparse, Spartan, paper walls, muddy sidewalks. That's a contradiction in terms there. Where the Japanese Americans were forced to live from many of the early years of the war. There was even a Supreme Court case, Korematsu versus the United States. When you see the word Korematsu, it has an Asian sound to it. That might help you remember. But basically, Korematsu versus the United States followed exactly what Schenck versus the United States said. As long as there's clear and present danger, you can suspend civil liberties. And so many people of Japanese industry, sorry, ancestry, were taken out of their homes, lost possessions, and shipped inside the country, in the interior. Now, if you do remember, when we were talking about the war in Europe, the 442nd Go For Broke Regiment became famous as also nicknamed the Purple Heart Regiment. They got more Purple Hearts than any regiment during the war. These were Japanese Americans fighting in Europe, mostly Italy, in a, such a way to prove the bravery of not only themselves, but of all their people in the United States. And things like that helped us soon to realize that sometimes America can be a big, dumb idiot. And as a result of that, in the 90s, Bill Clinton helped to sponsor legislation to produce some long, um, long needed reparations to Japanese Americans. Money was paid to survivors, uh, an apology was given, not the easiest way to do things, but it was important. All right, we're going to skip through foreign policy and go to changes in society. So excuse the slashes here. Of course, you'll have a moment to do DOK 12.4a. Write the opening two paragraphs on a speech defending the limits imposed on wartime civil liberties. You as two examples of previous times when it was utilized. So pause, take a moment. Go ahead and write the answer to that while I skip ahead to the next section, changes in society. A very important change in society, again, long overdue, was in 1948, Harry Truman desegregated the armed forces. If you remember, we went way back to the Civil War to have our first, quote unquote, colored regiments the 54th Massachusetts. It took a long time during in the Civil War for people to realize that these black soldiers could be used in combat. Of course, they had to be led by white officers, Robert Gould Shaw, but still they were able to prove their bravery and their mettle, especially at the Battle of Charleston, enough that Americans realized black troops can fight just as well as white troops. Moving forward, you get to World War I, and in World War I, Black troops were used in combat fairly often, but again, with white officers. It wasn't until World War II that groups like the Tuskegee Airmen or the 761st Tank Battalion were able to have their own black officers leading these troops and their gallantry, courage, but maybe more importantly, their ability showed America that blacks and whites were equals when it came to fighting in warfare. And Truman made the next logical step and wiped out segregation in armed forces. Now, very interesting concept when you think that the civil rights movement is going to move very quickly starting in the 1950s. And you wonder whether it was things like Jackie Robinson in baseball, you know, if blacks can play baseball just as good as whites, or Truman with the soldiers, if black soldiers can fight just as well as white soldiers, you wonder how much of those kinds of social moves uh, prepared America for the civil rights movement. And if that wasn't enough, you could take a minute to Google Superman takes on a new enemy, the Klan, to realize that after Superman had defeated Adolf Hitler, he needed a new enemy. So he came back to the United States. The creators of Superman realized that the next big enemy was the KKK. What an interesting view in American society when Superman's enemy is the Klan. Another group that made vast changes were women. Women had produced a lot of wartime material working in factories. Of course, you have Norman Rockwell's famous Rosie the Riveter image 
This lady right here was a famous Hollywood actress. I can't really for, remember for sure her name. Um, Rita Hayworth, maybe. But, you know, just trying to poke fun at, you know, women in, working in factories. But that's not what it was like at all. Women were everywhere. They were flying planes. They were driving trains. They were building ships. They were holding, look at the size of this riveter. That's the biggest automatic screwdriver you've ever seen in your life. And women began to work with huge results during World War II. Well, as you can see in this graph, 1940, women in the workforce, you know, before the war, women were about 20% of the workforce. And here you advance to where we are now, and it's almost 50-50. Wonder what it would be. This graph was 2005. Skip forward to 2019, it might actually be 50-50. But it was this time period where women proved there's not a lot of jobs that we can't do. Not a lot of things. Uh, down here in the bottom right, you're going to see kind of a funny little thing that came out of this. Brownie Wise was selling Tupperware faster and better than anyone else. And so Brownie Wise became one of the key proponents of Tupperware parties. As women began to make huge inroads in sales and marketing and leadership of companies. Another example of American changes in society, the GI Bill. If you look back at World War I, after the war, we had promised our veterans a bonus. When the Great Depression hit and they had not received their bonus, you might remember the bonus army marched on Washington, D.C., and Herbert Hoover met them with fire hoses and fire because he was scared of a socialist revolution. Well, things like that kind of stuck in our memory, and with the incredible effort put forth by so many of our GIs to win World War II, after the war, the American government found a way to say thank you. First off, with the GI Bill, was sending veterans to college. Would you have gone to college without the GI Bill? 52% of Americans said, no, we would not have made it to college. That's a lot of people going to college that never would have gone before. This is a time when going to college kind of became the birthright of Americans, became the logical next step. Now, is this the only next step available to people today? No, that's ludicrous to say so. There's many next steps. But America began to look at college as kind of, that's what you do. And so many, many GIs came back to America. Think, th think about this for a minute. You're an 18-year-old farm boy from Kansas getting ready to play on a college football team for the first time. Toughest thing you've ever done in your life is make sure that Bessie got into the pasture. Well, you're lining up across from a guy who just fought the Japanese at Guadalcanal, the island of death. He's 25 years old. He's seen buddies killed, wounded. He might have even gotten stabbed. And he's going to kick the ever-living car out of you in this drill. Made for some interesting practices. The other part of the GI Bill that you might be interested in is the birth of homes. Because the government helped pay for soldiers to get their own house. This was the beginnings of, what do you call that area outside the cities where everybody lives with all the shopping malls? And the soccer moms, well, yeah, we call that the suburbs. You needed lots of room to build lots of houses. We'll talk in the next unit a little bit about the way they built these houses, but it basically became the assembly line for building with, with builders like Charles Levitt making large, large neighborhoods like you could see here. But men began to move home into their new homes with their new wives. And what were they doing? Oh, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We had a baby boom. Maybe the single biggest social economic influencer in our country today. A huge, as you can see in the red here, increase in births. So you can see the spike as soldiers were returning from home. Hey, honey. And then it stayed pretty high. And then, as you notice, birth rates start to drop pretty rapidly in the 60s to where you can see even today, our birth rate is very low. You can see all the babies in overwhelming this hospital. You can see this family, not just the fact they have four kids, but look how close in age they are, or this nursery right here. But we had a baby boom, and the baby boomers are going to influence American society heavily over the next few decades. 
Think about it this way. What is the 60s known for? Well, it's known for hippies and protest. Well, how old were baby boomers in the 60s? Oh, they're teenagers. Who else raises a ruckus and whines and complains and protests more than teenagers? Oh, I don't know. Another change was our change in the economy. We had an economic boom, maybe the biggest economic boom in our nation's history. Now, why? Well, if you remember, after World War I, our economy had a head start. Europe was just behind. Well, the destruction after World War II was a much higher level. You remember, we had introduced bombing by airplanes. How would we make Germany and Japan finally quit the war? We destroyed all their factories. We bombed them to a place where they could not produce materials for the war effort. We blew up bridges. We blew up railroads. Well, everything you need for an economy, we had destroyed in order to win the war. Same had happened to much of Europe. London, Paris, and so there wasn't really any other nation that had escaped destruction like the United States. I mean, there was no bombings in the United States. There were no air raid attacks. And so our economy was ready to go, and as you can see in this graph right here, starting in 1945, it took off. Another way to think of it is this. 6% of the world's population, the United States people, were producing 50% of all things. We were producing half of the world's goods and services, and we were able to get very, very rich on those. We'll look a little bit closer in this when we talk about the culture of the 1950s, but we, this is when Disneyland's going to appear, and nothing says more about an economic boom than Mickey Mouse. Another example of things that changed during this time has to do with the Taft-Hartley Act. The Taft-Hartley Act was a pro-union measure that outlawed the closed shop. Closed shop meant that everybody who went to the shop had to belong to a union. Well, things were so going so well that people didn't really need something like the Taft-Hartley Act or the closed shop in order to make things work. There were unions and there was management, but since everyone was making money hand over fist, they kind of got along. It was actually a good time to be in a union. A good time to join the Green Bay Packers. Oh, yeah, the Green Bay Packers. So that is the key for our 12.4, part one. In part two, we'll discuss our changes in foreign policy. Won't you please be my neighbor? <laughs>